to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father
What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. I'm sure if you've ever been to a, um, uh, a revival service, you have heard. Maybe even you've walked to the front of an auditorium before to this hymn. Um, and then there's a little bit extra thrown in, uh, some, new, some new lines there to, I think, help us to reimagine why the author or the, the composer wrote the song. Uh, it says, I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. Um, I think we as Christians can sometimes get this idea that people need to be fixed before they come to Jesus and maybe uh, they need to clean up their lives before Jesus. Or, and maybe that's just um, something that unbelievers put on themselves is the idea that they have to be somewhat cleaner to come to Jesus than they, they currently are. But I think that that is putting on to the human what the work of Jesus is, what the work of the Holy Spirit is. And uh, so we need to really remember that people don't have to come clean to Jesus. They don't have to come already forgiven. That's us doing the work. Let's let Jesus, the Holy Spirit, do the work and, and just remind people that they get to come as they are. We did. Nobody made us clean up before we came. Um, so uh, uh, let's really reach out to people this week where they are. Shed for me and that thy 
Welcome, Calvary family. Thank you for joining us uh, in this means, in this media. And uh, let's just pause and pray and ask God to guide our hearts this, this day. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and the power that it contains because it is from your heart and mind. It is your will. 
Uh, and as we look at this passage in the book of James, we ask, O oh God, that you would open our hearts and minds to what you want to say to us this day. We pray, O oh God, that we might not just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word as well. Uh, your word transforms, changes, impacts, convicts, and brings about your will. And so may it be so in my life and all who hear this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take us to the book of James today, James chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading verses 14 to the end of the chapter. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. Turn there in your Bibles, James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. This is the word of the Lord. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith without itself, by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And may the Lord add his understanding, conviction, and uh, faith to his word this day. There's a story that's told uh, that uh, the devil had a meeting with his demons to decide how to destroy the faith of people in Jesus Christ, since they themselves believed in the existence of Jesus Christ, they wondered just how they would do that. One demon suggested that they tell people that Jesus never really existed, that people shouldn't believe in such fables and fiction. Another demon suggested that they persuade people that death ends all and that there's no need to worry about life after death. Just go ahead and live whatever way you want to. Finally, there was the idea that they tell people that there is a God, that Jesus Christ was a historical person, and that believing in him saves them after death. But all they have to do is profess faith in Jesus and then go on living as they always have, doing whatever they want to do. They decided unanimously on this final strategy as the most effective. And this is the strategy that James confronts in the word today. One of the greatest threats of faith in Jesus is knowledge without practice, faith without works. If there's one thing that James cannot tolerate, it is words without action. A profession of faith in Jesus without the actions of Jesus. If there's one thing that the world cannot tolerate, it is people who say they are Christians and don't live like Christ. If there's one thing this nation cannot tolerate, it is those who say they are Christians and they don't live like Christ. Just ask a nation in mourning over the deaths of hundreds of little ones who are entrusted to those who called themselves followers of Jesus. 
It's a grievous thing. This is a serious issue that James addresses for us this day. Here's his main point. Genuine faith in Jesus Christ is clearly evidenced in a life of good works. Let me say that again. Genuine faith in Jesus Christ is clearly evidenced by a life of good works. Three times he stresses this truth in a negative statement. In verse 17, he says, faith without works is dead. In verse 20, he repeats it. Faith apart from works is useless. And then finally, in verse 27, faith apart from works is dead. And so the question that we must ask ourselves this day, confronted by the word of God, does my faith work? My friend, does your faith work? It would probably be a better idea to maybe ask my spouse that question. Does Paul's faith work? Or maybe my children or grandchildren. Maybe my neighbor. Maybe my fellow Christians. Does Paul's faith work? My friend, does your faith work? A person may profess that he accepts who Jesus is, believes in him, what he taught and did, but unless that which he believes influences his actions, he cannot honestly claim to trust in Jesus Christ. Now, let's not get James wrong here. He is not teaching that we need to earn salvation by good works. He's calling us to live out our faith with our works. He's calling us to do good because our faith in Jesus Christ motivates us to do that. James is teaching that saving faith works. There are many ways that people claim to have faith in Jesus Christ. What are some of the faith claims that people have? A conversion experience? Said a prayer, a sinner's prayer in a, in a, in a service or walk the aisle of repentance? Um, grew up in a Christian home? A member of a church? Maybe an understanding, a clear understanding, an explanation of the theology of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the atoning work of Christ. Uh, maybe it's faithful attendance at church services or, or other faithful practices, devotion to reading God's word, memorizing, meditating, prayer, fasting, and so many other faithful practices. But do all these things really evidence the fact that we have faith in Jesus Christ. These are all good things, but can any of them guarantee that a person has genuine faith in Jesus Christ? James illustrates his point in verses 15 and 16 with a suppose story. Suppose you encounter a destitute person. He refers to them as a brother or sister in Christ. Uh, they have a dire need for assistance. There's an obvious problem in their life. It cannot be avoided. And this person is in desperate need of help. Maybe it's, it's just clothing. Maybe it's paying the rent. Maybe it's, it's food for, uh, to feed their family. But he says only words are offered. Nice words, good words. May God bless you. May the peace of Christ rest upon you. I hope all the best for you. James says, these are not good words, even though they are good works. These are not good works, even though they are good words. They are empty words. They are dead words. They are meaningless words. Why? Because the words of love are not accompanied by the acts of love. James asked the question, what good are these loving words? What good is it to speak words of kindness and care if they're not accompanied by deeds that relieve the suffering of others? Will the hunger of the poor be satisfied by caring words? Will good wishes put clothing on people's backs? Will, will kind words satisfy our conscience? It may, but will it profit the kingdom of God? Verse 17, James answers the question, these questions and many others. Faith by itself 
if it does not have works, is dead. Genuine faith cannot exist by itself. It must be accompanied by action. And now in the rest of the chapter, James goes on to give us some arguments to support this idea that faith without works is dead. Argument number one in verse 18, genuine faith is validated by works. James takes us back to the elementary school playground. You remember, a boy claims to be the fastest runner in school. You respond, oh yeah? Prove it. You say you're the fastest runner. Well, let's have a race and really see who can run the fastest, not who can talk about running the fastest. You see, claims are not enough. It matters what you do. We take it back to a, 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 a critical passage in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 25. There Jesus is teaching about the final judgment where the Son of Man is sitting on his glorious throne and he's pronouncing a final judgment like a shepherd who's separating the sheep from the goats. He's dividing them. And on the right will be true believers. They're the sheep. And he will say to them, come enter the kingdom of eternal blessing prepared for you. And they will say, why? Why do we deserve? Why, why are we allowed to enter in on the right into your kingdom? And he will say, because you've clothed the naked, you fed the hungry, you visited the sick, you relieved the suffering of those enslaved and in bondage. And then the story goes on where he addresses those who go to the left, the goats. Those are the false professors. Those who claim to be loyal followers of him. And he will say to them, depart from me into a place of eternal suffering. Because you did not clothe the destitute. You did not feed the hungry. You did not show mercy to those who are sick. And you did not care for those who were in bondage. So integral to faith is what we do, that Jesus will judge us by our works as an evidence of genuine faith in our lives. Where is the evidence that you have faith in Jesus Christ? Is there proof of your faith? Or is your faith just talk and no action? So first of all, genuine faith is validated by our works. Secondly, verse 19, genuine faith involves the whole person. It is holistic. You cannot compartmentalize faith. It affects every part of your being, body and spirit, mind, soul, emotions, will, actions. He says you believe in God. You believe that God is one. You do well. Your theology is good. You give mental assent to the supremacy and the sovereignty of God. This is good. Your theology is accurate. But is it enough for true and living faith? Is it enough to know accurately the truth about who God is and what he's done for us and what he's doing? He goes on to say even the demons believe. They give their mental assent and they shudder. They who violently oppose God. They who are total, whose whole being and existence is against God. Except, too, that he is supreme and sovereign. Their theology, their understanding of God is accurate and understanding. They even have an emotional response to, to that understanding of awe and fear. And yet, they do not give willing obedience to God. Genuine living faith is holistic. It not only involves what we think about God and what we feel about God, but also how we respond to God. The mind understands and acknowledges the truth of God. The heart desires the truth about God. The emotions are moved by the truth 
of God. And the will responds in obedience to God. If not, then we are no different than Satan and his demons. One of my favorite authors is a man by the name of uh, George MacDonald, dead over a century now. He lived during the 19th century in Scotland. He was a pastor and a prolific Christian writer. Devotional works, theological works, and uh, prolifically nonfiction works. He was one of the most loved authors of his day. He wrote that all of life's truths could be discovered in an extremely simple two-step process. First of all, accepting that Jesus is Lord, and secondly, obeying him as Lord. Let me quote him here as he relates to this topic. Do you want to live by faith, MacDonald writes? Do you want to know Christ aright? Do you want to awake and arise and live, but do not know how? I will tell you. Get up and do something that the Master tells you to do. The moment you do, you instantly make yourself his disciple. Instead of asking yourself whether you believe or not, ask yourself whether you have done whether you have this day done one single thing because he said, do it. Or once abstained because he said, do not do it. It is simply absurd to say you believe or even want to believe in him if you do not do anything he tells you. Thank you, George MacDonald, for clarifying the simplicity of living faith. Genuine faith is validated by works. It involves the whole person. And finally, genuine faith leads to action. In verse 20, James challenges us with this stern and searching question. You don't want to be a fool, do you? Look at the plain evidence of genuine faith. And then he gives three examples of the evidence before them and before us. Two of them are from Scripture. They're stories in Scripture. And one is from our own personal experience of life. The first example that he uses is Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. And he refers back to Genesis chapter 15, where God spoke to Abram and gave him a promise. I'm going to bless you and you will be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. And it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous. His simple act of faith, of trusting in God, God's provision and calling and leading in his life was acknowledged as righteous. Now, Abraham was no different than any other people in his day. He was a pagan. He was just as spiritually bankrupt as anyone else. Uh, but God in his mercy and grace came to him and said, I've chosen to love you and to save you and to bless you and to make you a great blessing to all the peoples of the world. And Abraham believed God's word and he took them as a personal promise. He humbled himself before God and he accepted what God said is truth. And God declared that as a righteous response. Abraham didn't work for God's favor. He simply accepted God's gracious gift to him. Now, James fast forwards in the life of Abraham. Decades later, Abraham was waiting for years, decades, for a child to pass on that promise of God's blessing to all of the earth. And he was childless. But in a moment utterly impossible, God fulfilled his promise in giving him a son named Isaac. In Genesis 22, God puts Abraham's faith to the test. He commands him to offer his son back to him as a sacrifice, to take him to Mount Moriah, to build a stone altar, and there to offer his son as a burnt sacrifice to God. And Abraham believed God, and he obeyed God. And just as his arm was raised over his son's bound body on that altar to plunge it in and take his life, 
God intervened and stopped Abraham and said, now I see your faith. God saw Abraham's act of faith. His faith and actions worked together. His faith led to action. His faith in Genesis 15, James says, was made complete by his act of obedience in Genesis chapter 22. You see, his faith wasn't lacking in Genesis 15 at his first calling. It was proven and vindicated and displayed by his actions in Genesis 22. Faith and works are inseparable. Works are the natural consequence of faith. One commentator named William Barclay put it this way, no man will ever be moved to action without faith and no man's faith is genuine unless it moves him to action. Notice the result of Abraham's faith. James kind of slides this in here for us as an appeal to obey the Lord. He was called a friend of God. In this one little word, James describes the intimacy and the dignity of Abraham's relationship with God. Imagine God looking at you and going, my friend, because you trust me and you obey my word. You cannot know God intimately apart from obeying him. The second example he gives after Abraham is Rahab. Now, there cannot be any more, more different people than Abraham and Rahab. They are at extremes apart, humanly speaking. One is a Jew. Rahab is a Gentile. Abraham is a devout worshiper of God. Rahab, <laughs> she's immoral. She's heathen. Both share a common, genuine faith in the living God. In Joshua chapter 2, where we find the story of Rahab, Israel is prepared to enter the promised land as they are being led by God to occupy uh, the the promised land. And that means that the first city that they must conquer is the city of Jericho. And Joshua, the commander of the Israelite army, sends spies out into the city on a reconnaissance mission. There they find Rahab, probably trying to be covert. They enter into a house of ill repute. Men go into those places. Rahab welcomes them in. And she discovers who they are. She gives them shelter from the authorities. And she sends them off on a way of safety so that they will not be captured and put to death. This is what she said to those spies. Her declaration of faith that was accompanied by her actions to side with those spies and the people of Israel. She said this in in Joshua chapter 2, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how God dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. Is that not a declaration of faith in God, in his supremacy? and in his sovereignty. And yet, just that declaration was not enough. It was accompanied by the works that put her own life at risk to side with the God of Israel and the Israelites and send those men away to safety. You see, Rahab believed with her mind, just like all the people of Jericho. She was moved by emotion, fear, and trembling just like all the others in the, in the city of Jericho. But she responded with her will in obedience and submission to the Lord Almighty. Her faith in the Lord motivated her to do something that was right, regardless of the risk to her own safety. She risked her life to side, to go to the side of the Lord, to protect those spies, and in doing so, proved her faith in the Lord. 
Abraham, Rahab, and the third evidence that he brings out is in verse 26. A living human being consists of two parts, a material body and an immaterial spirit, an outer man, a physical body, and an inner man, a spiritual soul that resides within every living human being. Now, when these two are separated, all you have left is a corpse, is death. And a corpse cannot do anything. There's no will, no feeling, no thoughts, no interactions with any other human being on this earth. Faith without action is as dead as a corpse. Useless, helpless, unprofitable, dead. In the same way, faith and works are inseparable. If there are no acts of Christ as a result of profession of faith in Christ, then that faith is not true, genuine faith. It is no more active and alive than a corpse. Why are actions of obedience to Christ so vital to the Christian life? Because genuine faith in Jesus is clearly evidenced by a life of good works. And James supports that with these ideas that genuine faith is validated by good works. Genuine faith involves the whole person. We cannot compartmentalize faith in our lives. It impacts all of us. And genuine faith leads to action. And he proves that with these three examples. I want to defer once again to George MacDonald, to lead us in applying this truth uh, to our lives today. And I quote him. He says, uh, thus again comes the question, what have you done this day because it is the will of Christ? What have I done? If we chance to do his will because it falls into our own designs, That may be a good thing, but it is not obedience. Obedience comes when, as a conscious act, we lay aside the appetite, the desire, the inclination of our flesh, our self, the tendency in which our own human soul would go if let to itself, and instead do what he tells us, subduing our own will, mastering it, subjugating it, and bringing it into submission to his will. Have you or I today dismissed even once an anxious thought for tomorrow because Jesus told us? Have you ministered to any needy soul or body and kept your right hand from knowing what your left hand did, telling no one of your action? Did you set yourself not to criticize, talk against, or judge others? Did you bring fair and righteous judgment to your decisions? Are you wary of covetousness? Did you forgive your enemy and do good or show him kindness? Are you seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness more than any other things? Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Have you this day given of money, time, or possessions, or skills, or compassion to someone who has asked of you? Have you shown consideration, done good, returned kindness for wrong done to you, extended patience, been a servant, rejoiced in adversity, taken the role of humility before others, prayed for someone you don't like, trusted God to to, to supply a pressing need? Have you done any of these things? suppressing your natural tendency to the contrary and done them with rejoicing because Jesus said to do them? Tell me something you have done, are doing, or are trying to do because he told you. If you cannot, is it any wonder you have difficulty trusting in him? Now listen, my friends. None of us can do what Christ commands perfectly. The important thing is not perfection, but it is direction. 
The important thing is the direction of your will. Is it moving away from God towards self? Or is your will oriented towards submission and obedience to the will of Jesus Christ? Obedience is not perfection. But desiring and trying to do what you know Christ would have you to do. That's obedience. And responding to it with our resounding yes. Christ knows you're trying and failing. He knows the longing of your heart and it is to follow him. And he will help you in that direction. In time, you will do the will of God even as Jesus Christ did his will. And so, my dear friends, beloved brothers and sisters, don't give up. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Keep trying. Keep trusting. Keep depending on him. Keep doing what he has told you to do. Let your faith live and move and work. George MacDonald put it this way. Christ takes the will in the imperfect deed and makes the deed at last perfect. His life is in our hands. We have nothing but to trust him and obey him. The world is his. The eternity belongs to him. Entrust your life to him in complete submission and obedience to his will. You may be here today listening to this message and, and thinking, boy, those Christians, they drive me crazy, nothing but hypocrites. Well, I ask you today, what are you trusting in? What is your faith grounded in? Who are you staking your life on? I invite you to trust in the person of Jesus Christ, not in Christians, not in their false behavior, not in their imperfections. Don't use that as a smokescreen to divert your faith or as an excuse not to trust in Jesus. Look to him. Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you. He rose for you and he lives today for you. And someday, my friend, you must stand before him as your judge. Will he direct you to the left or to the right? Trust in Jesus Christ today and be saved. Father, thank you for your grace in our lives. Thank you for these truths from your word. Thank you for the, the applicability of this, even in, even in this week, as we look at how the church has failed and done wrong. Oh, dear God, we pray that the true Christians would stand up and do right. We pray that you would motivate us to not only give lip service to you, to sing to you, to pray to you, to be devoted to you with faithful practices, but also to obey you, to do your works, O oh God. As difficult as they may be, you have promised to assist us and to walk with us, to empower us, to have the will and the ability to fulfill your purposes. And so I pray for myself and for all who listen today that they would respond with their resounding yes to your will. Thank you for leading us in truth this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and grant us his peace. Amen. God bless you.